Our next adventure took us to the Sierra Nevada foothills, eight miles east of Jackson in Amador County. Now to get to this particular state park, we traveled down some beautiful little country roads and through the historic little community of Volcano. Our destination was Chausse Indian Grinding Rock State Historic Park, a 135-acre park created in 1968 that is a very special place. First thing we did after we got to the park was to visit the Chausse Regional Indian Museum, which features a variety of exhibits and an outstanding collection of Sierra Nevada Indian artifacts. From the museum, we hooked up with our host for a walk around the park, which includes a typical Miwok village that's been reconstructed. Now, it's been reconstructed in order to preserve the Miwok heritage and their traditions and most importantly to share these traditions with present and future generations of Californians. Now what are these four uh, little houses here? I, well, I was going to say teepee right. but I know that's not the correct word is it? No it isn't. Not, not for this part of California it isn't. Um, teepee is a Lakota Sioux word and it means dwelling and for some reason uh, all all the homes that Indian people used to live in are now called teepees by people who don't know better. And these are umachas. These umachas. Are umachas. And these are bark houses made of cedar bark. And these are old-fashioned, old-time uh, winter houses. Now, are these the kind of houses that the people who lived here would have lived in? Yeah, in most of parts of the California, they would live in, uh, especially in the foothills, those type of houses that were made of the bark from the cedar. Mm -hmm. Now, is that because they were warmer, because they were made of, of this kind of wood? Yes, and because of the cedar bark has great insulation, and so they could live in it during the winter and it'd keep out the snow and the rain. Wow. Mm -hmm. So these are reconstructed exactly the way they would have been yeah, here. Yeah, basically they are. Mm -hmm. Now, these again are called? Umachas. Umachas. And what would a would a family of how many people be living in an umacha? I'd say it could hold maybe six to eight people. The extended family went out in all directions, though, because it's kind of hard to put on a number that actually stayed in here because grandmothers and grandfathers, aunts and uncles, they all played very important roles in these earlier, the earlier peoples, and so they would have them also staying here, maybe not necessarily in the same, same but bark house, but in a grouping in itself. So. Oh, wow. And this is made of cedar, bark. of cedar. And it was used primarily during the winter time because of, as Marcus stated, because of the insulation that it would actually keep them warm during the winter. Now, would uh, there be fires inside there? Yeah, there would be built, a, probably build a small fire in the middle and the, the smoke itself would rise up and go out the top. That's the way a lot of quote unquote teepees were designed, but the opening in the front would also allow the smoke to go out too, and depending upon what they put over the doorway too to keep the wind from blowing in. But you have to realize, too, during the wintertime, everything was done in here. But during the summertime, everything was done outside of the bark houses themselves. They weren't really used during the, during the summertime. So this was the winter, this yeah. was a winter home? Primarily. Hugh, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce you to uh, Alvin Walupi. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Oh, you're fine. Yeah. Alvin is the uh, chairman of the Sierra Native, uh, Sierra Native, Native American. American Council. Thank you. And uh, his wife. Hello. How are you Hello. doing? Nice now, you're here. sitting here under this beautiful big old oak tree. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of stories. If that tree could talk, aren't yeah, there? Sure, it would be. be a lot of stories. Could I'd, li you I'd like to hear half of them. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we were in for a real treat because we were taken inside an authentic Miwok roundhouse, which in the old days was the setting for a variety of social gatherings and ceremonial events. This roundhouse is spectacular, 60 feet across, one of the largest in California. Sometimes I come down here like when I want to pray. This is our church and this is where most of the prayers are said and so a lot of times I like to come down here when it's quiet and say my prayers to the Creator. It's really nice to be in here and really feels good. There's just a real good feeling about being inside here. Wow. That's just like I was telling you, I get a different feeling when I get in here. I, I, it changes when you walk through the door. You feel altogether different. I do. I think uh, a lot of people, even non-Indian people, will say that before they leave the park. They've had the privilege of coming in here 
and standing in here or sitting in here, they'll say, it didn't feel like I wanted to leave. Now I'm here with R Ramona Dutchkey, who is a Miwok, and you are making a basket, and I assume you're making it the same way that your ancestors would have made it. Yes, I'm using the Miwok technique, and this is, this is uh, something that is alive. And I'm working with something that isn't plastic. Mm -hmm. So I know that I have to handle it as though it were alive, and I have to take care of it. And so it's a philosophy. I made these from willow sticks, willow beads. Look at this. And the red beads are uh, madrone berries. And they're shell beads. These were made from pine nuts. Wow. This is a split cottonwood and red bud. And then I've used cattail for weaving here. This is a little sample of cattail and willow. This Look is a medicine all. smell. Isn't that oh, good? Oh, boy. boy. Good. Now, what would you use this for? Oh, anything, you know. It's good for sinus and, you know. I sprinkle it in my bed and when I'm feeling. <laughs> <laughs> it has a nice, you know, it's nice. You should try it. Makes I you will. Feel good. Makes you feel good. That's a nice order, doesn't it? Now, there are many fascinating things to see and do at Indian Grinding Rock State Historic Park. But the centerpiece of the park, and the way it got its name, is the rock itself. Now, tell me a little bit about this rock, because it's pretty spectacular, isn't it? Yes, this is the largest grinding rock in North America that has been found. They've counted over 1,185 grinding holes or mortars that are on, on the, this particular rock. They also have discovered that there are 364 petroglyphs, which are rock carvings, and the last ones have been dated over 2,000 years ago. Now, when we talk about the holes, these are the, what do you call these? these we call these chasse. That's what the, the park is called, and that's a Miwok word meaning the mortar hole or the cup. And how would they make these holes in the rock. Over years and years of pi uh, pounding acorns, the holes would be made, and when they got too deep, they'd start in a new spot and do it again. So you mean they would start pounding on a flat rock? Right. Uh -huh. And over the years, it would just make that, It'd make, make that it hole. deeper, and when it got too deep, I've even heard from some of the elders that they actually cooked in some of the holes, like, they put it heated rocks on the bottom and they'd put meat or whatever they were cooking over the top and actually cook in the holes. It was a meeting place also for, for families had like their own spot on the rock. And they'd come out over generations, it'd be passed on to different members of the family. And so it was a real gathering place, a social place where the Indian people could talk. And Now what do you mean families? You mean there would be a hole that would be known as the place where such and such a family would would grind their acorns? A hole or an area that was, uh, that had been like in the family for years and years that has been passed down through a generations. A specific hole. I, mm -hmm. I, if I could add, Hugh, I, I think that it would be an area. And for generations after generations, this was the area where your family went. And, and the best way that I can describe this in modern terms would be like a big old community kitchen. Mm -hmm. And it was a place where it was real hot. Sometimes there'd be temporary uh, shade shelters put up. Over the rock. Uh-huh. In just, you know, not a huge thing, right. but where you were working. How many generations of people do you think actually used this rock? That's a lot, maybe 20, 30, 40 you generations. Have you well, David, over seven, th uh, over three or thousand years or so, how many generations would 3, that be? 3,000 years? 2,000, 3,000 years, maybe more. You mean this rock was actively used for 3,000 years? Mm -hmm. Maybe longer. Goodness gracious. Up until uh, it became a state park in 68, <laughs> it was used just prior to that with some of my, uh, my relatives. So it's been used before and just not too long ago. So you mean your relatives would come here to grind acorns? Yeah, I had a great aunt and also my mother used to come down here occasionally too and then grind acorn occasionally in, in not necessarily a specific area like they were talking about earlier, but they would come down and grind acorn here occasionally before it became a state park. Hugh, we've been talking about uh, grinding and using that 
that big old uh, rock over there, pounding acorn into flour. And what we have here is a portable mortar. That a we portable brought, mortar. A portable mortar. And this was, uh, these were used when the weather was just too cold or not, not really good enough to be there on that rock. And uh, people had these. Families used these, too. And I'd like to introduce you to Sarah Coran. Hello. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? And, uh, Jen Denton. Hello. Hi, from the council. Now, can you show us how this works? Well, they just put a few of these in. So here are the acorns that have been taken out of the shell. Yes, first out of that and then cleaned and all the stuff taken off and then you and they pound it so really instead of grinding it was pounded it was pounding and, and, and also, until it's real fine and then it's put in here and uh, put in and, a big flat uh -huh, basket and like then they just flip it like this and until uh, the the coarse one would come down out and the fine would stay up here, see. So it was really, you pound it into kind of a, a powder mm -hmm, in here. Mm -hmm. Could yes. you do that a little bit more for us? Is there a technique to doing it? No. And David has got the finished product for us here. Now explain that to us, because we're all in for a treat. Well, the finished product here has to be cooked. After it's made into a powder form, it has to be leached. And by leaching, they're just basically using clear water to drain through the powdered form to get a, um, uh, to drain the tannic acid out of the acorn itself. Then before it's cooked, it turns out to be something like this, after it's just been leached. And then after it's cooked over the stove for a period of time, you come out with what they call a soup. It's this not, is soup. This is soup. It's not soup in the sense of uh, Campbell's noodle soup, but they refer to it as soup. It's just a liquid form of the acorn. And then also you cook it a little bit longer and you come out with what they refer to as a biscuit. And again, not the same idea of an oven bread, but it is a biscuit form. So they, uh, they just cook it a little bit longer and it, it gels together and becomes an acorn biscuit. Now, can we serve some of this up so oh, we can we try? Should, eh? Is this something that would be a normal part of your diet? Mm -hmm. Yes. How often would you eat this? Oh, well, I don't know. Just they well in the olden days they you know I guess had it nearly every meal. Mm -hmm. you know. Now, not everybody likes this, do they? No, it is an acquired taste. Why are you laughing well, when I said that? Because most people don't. For really? the first, when they taste it the first time. So it's an acquired thing. Right, and if you eat it with meat and a little onion and things, it just enhances the flavor so of other foods. Who here likes it? Do you like it? I like it. Do you like it? <laughs> do you really like it? it? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> do you like it? I do. Yes, do you like it? I sure do. I was raised on it. Really? Do you like it? I like it. Uh, it is an acquired taste, one of which I had to acquire a taste for. <laughs> but Marcus, uh, he he mentioned that he doesn't care for it that much because not all Indian people ate acorns or, or this, this product that you see here. Mm -hmm. um, certain people had acorns, some people didn't, and we did, so this is what became of the acorn themselves. But And it's really quite historic that we're having this little meal and this demonstration right here in front of this rock which for thousands of years is where this happened. You're right. <laughs> well, let's take a taste. There it is. I'm not sure after what you all have said about it. It was just Marcus. <laughs> yeah. Well, come on, everybody. Grab, come on, let's get in here and see what this is like. It's, it, it has a, a, I think it's an acquired taste. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> you don't like it? <laughs> you need to have a little piece of meat or a little salt or uh, salt and, uh, and, you know. And it, it makes it you, you really like this. Uh -huh. oh, you and the kid and I like it. Well, if you like it, I'm going to let you have mine. All right. <laughs> I take all I can get. <laughs>